Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Low country company Blackbaud was exactly where they should have been decades ago, and it's panning out now post-COVID. CEO of Blackbaud will join us later on this program. I'm Chris William, and welcome again to the most widely watched and longest running program on Carolina business policy and public affairs seen each and every week across the Carolinas. In a moment, we kick the dialogue off with Andy Shane of the Post and Courier and Laura Ulrich from the Federal Reserve here in the Carolinas. We hope you stay with us because we start now. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Laura Ulrich from the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, Andy Shane of the Post and Courier, and special guest, Mike Giannone, President and CEO of Black Bond. And welcome again to our program, uh, Laura, nice to see you. Andy, welcome back to the show. Uh, Andy, you get the first pitch uh, about a week ago, certainly uh, tragic news, not unexpected, but longtime South Carolina Senator Hugh Leatherman, one of the most powerful men in the state, you could say rose to the iconic status of a uh, Strom Thurmond type of leader, passed away. How would you characterize Leatherman's impact on the Palmetto State? What would you say? His impact in the past couple of decades was immense. This was the man who essentially controlled the state budget over this period. Um, if you wanted anything done, if you... Um, and that's not overstating it, right? You're not <laughs> overstating not, not, not at all. And, and, it's, and it's unique because in South Carolina, it's a we're a legislature-heavy state. It's, it's really the governor doesn't have much power. The legislature wields power. So if you run the budget committee, such as the way um, Senator Leatherman did, you wield a lot of power, and he also was on a lot of other committees, including those that oversaw road priorities, um, that oversaw uh, uh, salary um, salaries for agency heads. I mean, this was the one person you needed to go to for a lot of things in South Carolina. Um, you know, one of the things, he, one of the legacies he will leave is that he helped negotiate the incentives that brought the Boeing plant to North Charleston. In fact, they he was jokingly called Senator Boeing because of his support and also he did it again when they uh, when when Boeing um, expanded. So again, his, his 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 contribution and his influence in the state cannot be measured. And it's it's a huge loss for those who are economic develop fans of economic development in the state because he was very pro economic development and giving those incentives so that South Carolina could win these jobs, win these businesses. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And of course, our, our sincere condolences and respect to his family and those who worked with him. Uh, Laura, let's bring you in the conversation. Andy used the term jobs. Boy, we can't not talk about jobs, workforce, labor participation, the rate of employment, the rate of unemployment. Um, are we forever changed, Laura? Is that when, when, when the Fed looks at jobs, how would you describe what's important to know about jobs and labor now? Yeah, it's a great question, Chris. And um, I'll, I'll say this is really what I'm spending a lot of my time on these days is looking at the job situation. In I'm the regional economist for North and South Carolina, so I cover both states. It's a very interesting situation right now because at this point, pandemic levels. So we're making as much in the United States as we made pre-COVID, but we're doing it with 4.2 million less workers. Um, and, and so in the state, in the Carolinas, we have fared better than the nation as a whole. So as of the last report, North Carolina was down 2.25% employment, South Carolina 2.2%. So very similar compared to pre um, So the question is, 
who are the people that have left the labor force and can we get them back? We can see that the labor force participation um, has gone down nationally. We're about 3 million people short. Um, it looks like about 30% of these, or maybe even more, were early retirements and accelerated retirements. Um, it is unlikely that those folks will return to the labor force uh, because many of them have turned on Social Security and, and they've decided to retire. But the other 70% that have left uh, that aren't retired now, that aren't in the older age groups, they are likely to return at some point. I think the question is when and how do we get them to come back? Yeah. Uh, Andy, let, let me loop you in on this. Before we do that, Laura, I want to tell you on the fly here, we're having a little technical issue with your audio. So just make sure there's nothing covering your microphone up or you're not hitting it. Andy, let's talk about this workers and the skills gap, because this is, this is not a new phenomenon, as you well know. Um, uh, companies, organizations have been complaining for years that they can't find the technology or, or the or, or the or the skills or the or the bench that they need. It seems exacerbated, but yet business kind of goes on. So is it a crisis? Is it something to complain about? And that's an understatement. But I mean, how do you characterize it? Well, I mean, what we're what we're seeing here in in, in my part of the part of the state of South Carolina is we're seeing businesses shutting down temporarily. So if we is that the answer to the labor thing? I mean, that and, and that's what it and that's what it seems yeah. to be. Or cutting down hours. Um, our, our, my local gym cutting down hours. Our local meet and three, as we say in the Carolinas, um, closed one of its locations because again they needed to consolidate workers at the other locations. We are we are seeing a, a local coffee shop again closing one of its locations. In fact, it's a downtown location where you could imagine it probably business is down because folks are staying home and the downtown crowd isn't coming in. Again, closing temporarily, um, and and again, adjusting hours, adjusting schedules to make do. Um, I, you know, I, I think the mo most common thing we're going to see this holiday season, in addition to Christmas wreaths and Christmas decorations, are help wanted signs. Those are just all over the place. You cannot turn around and and uh, and not and not miss one or not see a big something on the highway saying, "Look, we're looking for help." You know, can I can I follow up with something yeah. on that, Chris? So. I think one of the really interesting things for us to be paying attention to, and there's some uh, right now, some some interesting pieces that have been written on this is the demographics of the United States. And if you think about the baby boomer population, um, you know, this huge population that really provided uh, an immense amount of employees, right, at a time when also women were entering the labor force at much higher participation rates. So we really had this wave in the 70s, 80s, 90s of employees. And now that the baby boomers are retiring, and I, I read the other day, the typical year, there's 2 million baby boomers that retire, and this last year, 3 million retired, so mm -hmm. we're an extra million. There's not another generation behind them that's the same size, right? People have had fewer children, and so these entry-level jobs, um, there may be a, a dearth of workers for, you know, when you asked, have we changed permanently? This may be more of a permanent thing. This may not be a COVID thing. And so- but, Laura, but let, let me tease something out on you. Mm -hmm. But you talked about those that retired early, maybe around a million. And this, this is gonna be, a, apologies for the way I'm gonna ask this question. Can people afford to retire at that? Yeah. I mean, can yeah. everyone is an affluent, right? Right, but actually baby boomers on average have about $1.2 million. And now that's on, av that's on average. So the median is probably less than that. But the baby boomer generation is a wealthy generation. And um, so I think so. I mean, I, or they're at least making the decision that they do, right? It'll be interesting to see maybe 20 years from now if they still have enough money. But but I, I think they, they believe that they do. And, and this period of time has been interesting because while many businesses and many individuals have struggled during COVID, the stock market has done very well, right? So people's re retirement accounts or 401ks or IRAs look a lot healthier now than they did pre-COVID, so. That's of course, assuming capital markets hold up and right, exactly. kind of go the other way exactly. and that wealth effect all of a sudden becomes right. not right. wealth effect. But I, 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 you know what I'm asking? I'm kind of curious, Laura and, and Chris, what you guys think, what, what you all think of the idea that basically also for the folks who are not in the baby boomer who are younger, mm -hmm. the reason they're not coming back to these jobs is A, they obviously, we, we had all the stimulus money come in and B, wages really haven't gone up in the Carolinas. So why am I going to, why am I going to go ahead and go take a $10 an hour job when I've saved up all during this time um, because I wasn't spending money during COVID and I was getting money because of the, uh, the three waves of stimulus that came through.
So I will say, Andy, the evidence now is that um, especially lower income families that would have people that are making, you know, $10 an hour, they do still have some extra savings, but not enough to float them for a period of time. I think actually it's a much more complicated matrix of decisions that people are making. And it's about child care. It's about feeling safe at work. It's about health. It's about all the stimulus from last year. It's about all these things. And, and that's why when, when the you know, unemployment insurance ended, some people thought we would see this rush of people back in the labor market, and we didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because it is this really complicated matrix. You know, I feel like I've told people a thousand times this last year, but I'll say it one more time. As a working mom of three, this has been the hardest 18 months I've ever had being in that demographic. And so, you know, I think about what would life be like for me if, if I was in my demographic and was only making $12, $15 an hour, I might have made a different choice too, right? So I think, I think families are having to make decisions with a really complicated set of inputs. And so getting them back into the labor force may also be equally as complicated, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. We're going to, we're going to have to move on. Good point. Andy is a good question. And thanks, Laura. Uh, Andy, you get the, you get the last pitch here. We've got about a minute. We'll bring our guest on um, transportation, infrastructure, uh, uh, raising money, take your pick uh, right at the center of South Carolina, pretty stinking close centralized is this uh, this project that is uh, unaffectionately called Malfunction Junction. So the idea that uh, DOT in South Carolina is remaking a critical juncture, uh, where do you think that ends up, especially given now that we seems like we're pulling out of the COVID in this public health crisis? How do you think that plays out? Well, and, and again, for anyone who's driven through Columbia, they, they know what Malfunction Junction is. It's the intersections of interstates 20, 26, and 126. <clears throat> and for those who don't know, um, Interstate 26 intersects the entire state. So you're going from the upstate through the Midlands to the low country. So, you know, all those trucks, again, we've been talking a lot about logistics, has to get through this very crazy, um, this, this, ver this very busy, this very um, crowded and poorly um, designed uh, intersection. So for the next eight years, they're gonna tear it apart. So we all know with any construction project, things get worse before they get better. So, you know, it's a $1.7 billion project. It's the largest roads project in South Carolina history. It was the number one project on the hit parade before the COVID, of course, some money is coming in to help it. But that said, it's gonna, it's gonna have a major impact throughout South Carolina and to a certain degree, even, even Charlotte too, again, uh, I-77 coming down from Charlotte. Uh, it, it ends in, in Columbia. It ends near Malfunction Junction. Again, you hit 26. You know, you go to the right, you go to the upstate, you go to the left, you go to Charleston. Um, and essentially, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, but it, but there are many people in South Carolina, and I'm assuming, of course, also in North Carolina who, who come down here, who are going to be happy once this is done and taken care of because it is such a mess, but you're gonna to have to put up with the traffic in the meantime. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I, we know from, from street chatter, no pun intended, that uh, so, uh, DOT Secretary Christy Hall is probably the exact right person to lead that. Andy, thank you. Laura, thank you. The great hockey player Wayne Gretzky once said, to be successful, you need to be where the puck is going to be. Well, blackboard out of the low country, technology slash good firm that does good and well, uh, was certainly there in the early days of digital transformation and all things around ESG. We welcome now the CEO of Blackbaud. We're glad to see Mike Giannini. Uh, Mike, welcome to the program and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Mike, let's talk about this idea that we've all experienced now, the, the transformational uh, thing that we, the thing, the just transformational time, moment in our, in our history. So we've got digital transformation, we've got this future of, of workforce, we're working remotely, we've got a term that you coined, if you don't mind me using, called lo location agnostic approach. Mike, when we take all of these things together and we hear all the great things about working remotely, the darker part of that is quality control, productivity, the integrity of the worker, the casual nature. How, how do you square those and how do you manage those in an, in an environment kind of like Blackboard? Sure. Yeah, it's been uh, quite interesting the last 20 months. Um, what I believe has happened is we've seen an acceleration of what was going to happen anyway. Um, especially for information-based companies like Blackboard, we're a cloud software company. 
I think this applies to financial services and any business that's information based. Um, so for us, you know, the pandemic, um, which began in, in March of 20, uh, we became quite aggressive, um, probably in, in just a couple of months after it started, related to thinking about the fact that we were going to be a remote first company. We had always had about 25% of our employees being not near a black bot office. And so this was not new to us, but the rest of the company moving this direction was, was quite new. And we did quite well. Um, we had, in the previous five or six years, had gone through an internal transformation of our IT systems. And so we were able to support this fast move to all of our associates being remote. Um, we also had really started to focus a few months after that, so call it August, September, a year ago, in training our 500 or so managers around leading in a remote world. So things like onboarding new associates, running team meetings, building one-on-one -on -one relationships, and how to be a leader in a, in a world that's remote because we knew it was gonna be for a long time. For us now, it's permanent. Um, and so we started to focus on sort of the softer side of leadership and development and culture and relationship building over a year ago now knowing that you know, running the operations remotely was gonna be permanent. Now, from a quality standpoint, we had already put in the metrics in each of the departments around understanding productivity and quality. And so things like our call center, software engineering, sales, we already had those metrics because again, 25% of our workforce was remote. And so we had part each of those departments, partial um, of the total headcount was remote. And so we were able to build on what we already had put in place and it's gone quite well. We, we had not missed a beat operationally in every department in the company. Uh, well, I'll put this for questions. Laura, question? Yeah, Mike, to follow up on that, I'm curious how that impacts your, um, your acquisition of talent, so people. Have you opened the door entirely where people can be located anywhere across the country? And I'm also curious if it goes even beyond the U.S. borders. Does this allow you to recruit some, some talent overseas? Sure. Yeah, it's, um, it's been fantastic for us, Laura. We started this immediately, probably April of 20. And we basically removed the uh, zip code requirement of a job. Um, and it was more about time zones than zip codes and time zones, meaning what team are you on and what time zones are they in? Or if you're a customer facing associate, um, you have to be in a relative's common time zone. It's easy in the US with you know three hours, but we're an international company. So we had to be cognizant of time zones. So we started that immediately and our access to talent and diversity is like never been, we've never had before. It, it's been significant. So. We spent now 20 months hiring in this way. And so we're bringing on folks from, think, you know, Silicon Valley engineers that don't want to move, um, senior operating executives in Toronto. Um, and it's just been fantastic. Um, and so it's, it, we, I believe we've sort of laid down a, a new future of BlackBud, which is a lot more diversity, which is in our ESG and DNI programs, which has been a lot more successful because of removing the requirement of zip codes and then access to talent is in, you know, like I've never seen before. And this is my 40th year in the tech industry. It's been really fantastic. Even things like our, our internship program was 95% diverse. Wow. Uh, Andy, yeah. question? Let me ask you, I know you have said you cannot comment about the 2020 ransomware attack on Blackboard. But in general, can you talk about what tech companies can learn from these kinds of breaches, from these kinds of attacks, seeing how they seem to be happening more often? Yeah, sure, happy to. I can comment a little bit on that. I mean, we got some legal stuff going on. I can't talk about that. But in general, you know, we did really well um, in that because we were one of the few that sort of discovered the issue and shut it down before it impacted our operation. So we never had a negative impact to our operation. We had some negative impact to some data being exposed for customers, but the operation was never impacted. This is, I think, the biggest problem we have um, related to you know, foreign influence in the US. And it's a war. 
And a lot of people don't understand the scale of this. Here's an example. This is a multi-trillion dollar industry with a T. This is not a couple of folks in a garage, right? If you wanted to spend a couple of hundred thousand dollars, you could buy software and be a cyber criminal. It's for, the software's for sale. It's very sophisticated. It's nation state sponsored. Um, here's another data point, which I think is interesting. So we have a lot of sophisticated software systems that sort of monitor what's going on. And we can see sort of generally traffic out on the internet. Um, this, these are not things that impact us, but so we see a flow of bad things, if you will. You can't imagine what, what the volume is. In a single month, it's almost a 100 billion instances monthly. And that's just what we see because it's all software automated attempted attacks. This is a massive problem and we can't expect every business from a two person coffee shop to you know, the multi-trillion dollar market cap companies we have now to be able to alone protect themselves because institutions of all size, all sizes are being breached. It's a massive mm -hmm. problem. Uh, let, let's go to, I wish we could drill a little bit more into that one, Mike, but let's let's talk about these things called environmental, social and governance or something sure. you know well called ESG and many companies have ESG. So the operating divisions of companies now include ESG and also, as you know, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, DEI. So they have become permanent fixtures of large and small companies. How do you manage that is not a profit or even income center? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But how do you make sure that that is um, it, it, that it's assimilated into the company as it, <clears throat> as it is and as it should be and not just a box to check. Yeah, sure. So we, we at Blackboard got started early in this. Um, and, you know, the ESG trend really came from uh, Europe, European companies and European um, institutional investors were mo more focused on it. And obviously the last couple of years, um, you can't listen to a business station and not hear the letters ESG in the US now. And so it's a very big uh, and very important trend. As far as operationalizing it, um, I believe it has to become part of the regular cadence of the business. So what we've done at Blackbaud, we have a regular cadence of things like monthly operating reviews. We do things like annual operating plans and then three year strategic plans for things like software sales and different kind of sort of operating units. We've treated ESG the same way. So we've got a steering committee. We have uh, monthly operating reviews of how we're doing. We've got metrics set up. Um, we've included now and incorporated ESG at our board of directors level in our governance committee. So this board involvement and board oversight, you know, we're a public company, so we want to include it there as well. We have now built, for example, this time of year, there's a 2022 ESG plan and operating plan. And there's also a three-year plan with metrics based on where we want to take ESG and DNI and black bond. So that's be a part of the regular part of how you run the company. Laura. Yeah, I want to um, ask ask a question about the the cybersecurity issues you were talking about. Because in, in my head, I spent a lot of time at the Fed thinking about workforce and and mm -hmm. how we you know increase employment. What types of skills are you looking for to have in your employees and, and what types of skills are other companies looking for to try to prevent these types of events and to protect the, the data that you do have? And is it a hard time finding people with the skills that are necessary? Yeah, so, yeah, there's a lot of skills required. There's a core set of folks you need that have cybersecurity specific backgrounds that become a centralized group that are that run sort of a governance function company-wide but then over in our engineering teams everyone that's a, a software engineer needs to be skilled um, around the product they work on and the requirements for you know implementing best practices in cyber and then corporate IT needs to bring in best in class software solutions that we implement from cybersecurity so software companies that we deploy inside of our business. And then every employee in Blackbaud goes through training and they must pass and be certified mm -hmm. um, around cybersecurity related to using their laptops. And so it's, it's, it permeates everything that we do. 
We also, we also ask the board to participate in that. So it really is every employee. So you have sort of your, your core centralized experts and there's a war on talent related to those folks. Um, and then you've got basically every employee plays a role in this, everybody. Uh, Andy, we literally have a minute left. Do you have a quick question? Sure. Uh, you know, you talked about uh, obviously how you're having more people work remotely. What, is, what does that mean what you're going to do with your corporate headquarters you have now, as well as there were expansion plans, of course, pre-pandemic uh, with, with all of this? What, is, what does that do to, 30, to your, to your real estate functions? 30 seconds. Mark. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, we're, we're remote first, so we're all remote. We um, eliminated 50% of our global real estate a year ago. Uh, we're going to do, uh, we're going to eliminate the rest. We're keeping our global headquarters and it's going to be a building that's sort of a coalescing center. So we'll have monthly operating meetings there. We had a group of customers in last week. So we'll use that as sort of a gathering place for, for the company. And we will not be expanding you know, beyond that at this point. Uh, Mike, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry to rush you at the end there because that's, that's, that's a deep one and that's a big one, but thanks for joining us and please come back. Yep, thanks for having me. Thank you, Mike. Nice to see you, Laura. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Hope your weekend is good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you.